In a previous episode, we put the bulk of the engine back together, but there's still a few things that need to be done. And to start, we're going to put in these spark plugs, which are specced for a 1999 Suburban. What is not specced for a 99 Suburban is this HEI distributor, which is specced for any mid to late 1970s era GM small block. And the main reason I'm going with this style distributor instead of a traditional distributor and external coil is because the built-in coil design will reduce wiring clutter in the engine bay and also take up less space, as I won't have to find a place to mount the coil. Only one wire needs to go to the distributor in order to power it as it grounds itself to the block. And there is a TAC output signal which can connect directly to the Phytech computer and my tachometer. This particular distributor that I went with is also see-through, which allows you to see the rotor in action and even see the arc jump between the rotor and the contacts on the distributor cap as it rotates around, giving you extra scene points at the local car meets. We'll also replace the front timing cover primarily for cosmetic purposes, but also because it's probably not a bad idea to replace it if it's the original one since it is made of plastic and is designed to be replaced upon removal. This cover also has built-in seals, which allow the process to be done in one simple step, once you check the mating surfaces for any dirt, of course. This aftermarket cover also has a crank position sensor plug, which we will install, since unlike the factory computer, the Phytech system will not need one. I also ordered a new harmonic balancer, also primarily for cosmetic purposes, but it also can't hurt to replace it either at a reasonable $40. I've done everyone the liberty of leaving out the removal process as it was very frustrating and the footage did not come out well at all. But just keep in mind that the removal requires a special wheel puller tool, which you can get at Harbor Freight or at a local auto parts store. And that even with this tool, you're going to spend somewhere around two hours cursing at your engine. We'll also replace the rear main seal, which is especially important to do since this engine will be bolted to a manual transmission. Any oil leaks from this rear main seal could greatly reduce the life of the clutch or ruin it altogether. This late model era small block Chevy uses what's called a one piece rear main seal, which is supposed to be easier to install than the more traditional two piece seals of earlier small blocks. However, I had to put up a good fight with it in order to get it on without damaging the seal. A small bit of frustration in exchange for peace of mind that I won't have to worry about any serious oil leaks once the engine is bolted to the transmission. After reinstalling the oil pan and installing the engine on this lower profile engine stand, we can fill the engine with oil, install this flywheel with a questionable level of security, and install the starter. For testing purposes, we'll throw on this Demon carburetor with a homemade bowl filling apparatus. And to control the ignition and starter, we'll make a makeshift control panel out of an old Harbor Freight electrical terminal box, which will also hold a mechanical oil pressure gauge just to ensure that the engine is actually cranking with oil pressure. With the bowl on the carburetor filled, let's try and start this engine for the first time in four years. Not bad for our first ever attempt at starting it, but can we get repeatable results? So far so good, especially considering that there are several variables to adjust here, including timing and fuel mixture, and obviously there is a very finite supply of fuel in the carburetor. To the fire. Oh. After a few attempts, I think it's safe to say that the engine will run. It's just a matter of fine-tuning those air, fuel, and spark variables. 
which will be much easier to do once the engine's in the vehicle along with the fuel delivery system. With the test fire complete, we can go ahead and more permanently install the flywheel using Loctite, as well as install the pilot bearing. The pilot bearing is manual transmission specific, and its purpose is to line up the input shaft of the transmission with that axis of rotation, since the input shaft of the transmission is not directly driven by the engine, as that energy goes through the clutch assembly first. With the pilot bearing installed, we'll go ahead and test fit our alignment tool with the clutch. And I'll explain what this alignment tool does shortly. But for now, let's go and secure this flywheel using the provided bolts and some red Loctite. We'll mark the bolts that have already been Loctited with a little dab of the same substance, just to make sure that we don't leave any out. Then we'll torque each flywheel bolt to spec in a typical crisscross pattern. It is important to use red Loctite on these bolts because they will be incredibly difficult to get to once the clutch assembly is completely installed. Since both the flywheel and the crankshaft are a harder alloy, these bolts have a higher chance of backing out, especially if they were not torqued properly. This, and most clutches for that matter, install in three pieces. We have our flywheel, clutch disc, and pressure plate. And they will bolt together like so. Now this is where that black plug-like tool comes in handy. Its purpose is to center the clutch disc between these two hypothetical metallic buns. There's a number of reasons it's important that the clutch be centered, but the most notable reason is that this clutch is what directly interfaces with the input shaft on the transmission. So all the power that is transferred to the clutch is directly translated to that shaft. And if it's off center, the shaft cannot fit inside this entire assembly and therefore will not be able to receive power from the engine. Tightening the pressure plate bolts in a star pattern will hold that clutch in place until the transmission can be installed. By default, the clutch is currently engaged and cannot be disengaged until pressure is put on those fingers you see around the plug. And that's exactly what happens when you press down on your clutch pedal, which in turn disconnects the engine from the transmission to allow for gear shifting as well as to move from a complete stop. Boonk. Next, we'll install this chrome crank pulley, which is secured by one center bolt and three outer bolts. And just to be safe, we'll also lock tight these, but we'll use the less aggressive blue lock tight. Next, we'll install the water pump. And for this build, I'm using a short water pump instead of the factory tall water pump that comes on the Vortec. And like the distributors, there's several variations of water pump, virtually all of which are interchangeable between different blocks. There are different advantages and conveniences to the different types and sizes of water pumps. And I'm not going to go too far into detail, but the most important thing here is that there are clockwise or regular rotation water pumps and counterclockwise or reverse rotation water pumps. And this is a very important distinction because on a serpentine belt setup, both sides of the belt will turn pulleys. But on a V-belt system, only the inner side of the belt will turn accessories, which introduces a small problem. The smooth side of the serpentine belt is going to turn pulleys in the opposite direction. Therefore, the internals of that water pump are going to have to be mirrored in order for it to pump water efficiently. For this reason, I had to purchase a clockwise rotating water pump, since both the crankshaft, which is turning clockwise, and the water pump are both coming into contact with the underside of the V-belt. On a factory 1999 Suburban, the outer side of the serpentine belt would end up rotating the pump counterclockwise. And I do think ordering the wrong water pump is a common mistake people make and they end up overheating their engine and they can't figure out why. 
so it is definitely important to factor in your belt configuration when selecting a water pump. Now the main issue we're going to run into here while installing this short water pump is the clearance from the timing cover. The Vortec engines come with a thicker timing chain and therefore require a thicker timing cover, which is one of the reasons for the implementation of a tall water pump. However, the main clearance issue appears to be one of the timing cover bolts, so in theory all we have to do is cut one of these down to get it out of the way. So that's exactly what we'll do. With the timing cover bolt cut down, the pump appears to fit great, so now we'll just make sure it's not going to interfere with the harmonic balancer, and then we can go ahead and install our gaskets and other hardware. And from the looks of it, everything clears any moving parts. We'll also install the thermostat and this upper coolant hose pipe slash thermostat housing. Finally, we'll just check all of our bolts and make sure they're tight. And then the engine is just about ready to be dropped into the truck. Just one last finishing touch. Until, of course, the alternator and all the hoses go on. And here's the final result. It's crazy to think we've gone from engine destined for the crusher to this beautiful piece of machinery ready to drop into a hot rod. And there's definitely some beauty in taking something this far gone and bringing it back to life. And while unfortunately we can't bring back the driver of the original vehicle, this engine will live on to see another day and another vehicle and tell a dark but important story from its past hopefully raising some awareness to how dangerous the roads can be. Next time on Trip the Road. Just with the right threads, right? It's maybe a touch short, but it's better than anything else.